Could we turn Earth into Jupiter by just adding more atmosphere? Can we learn to talk to aliens by talking to animals? And what is YouTube doing and why is it bad? In Q&A Plus, will Vera Rubin find an asteroid on a collision course with Earth? All in this question show. It's time for the question show. Your questions, my answers, as always, wherever you are. If a question pops in your brain, just write it down. I'll gather them up and I will answer them here. All right, let's get into the questions. Schnatz Grummelt. I remember something about gas giants having a solid core. Could Earth be turned into a gas planet giant if you just kept giving it more atmosphere? So there's a couple of misconceptions here. The first thing is this idea that a gas giant like Jupiter is really just a solid core surrounded by an atmosphere. And there's like bits of truth in that. There are many times the mass of the Earth in rock and metal inside Jupiter that if you went and did a core sample all the way down to the center of Jupiter and you pulled out some of its the material at the very center, it would be a lot of rock and metal. But it's not this really simple, you know, there's the the metal rock ball, or maybe there's even just like rock and then inside that there's metal and then around that is hydrogen helium, which is most of the composition of Jupiter. And it used to be thought that actually that was the case that you would start at the surface of Jupiter, you'd have these clouds of ammonia and methane. And then as you dug down deeper, it would just switch into just pure hydrogen and helium of varying densities, and like ridiculous densities, like as you go down through the hydrogen and the helium, the densities just increase and increase and increase. And eventually you've got hydrogen, hel you know, you've got hydrogen that is being turned into behaving like metal, it is under so much pressure. And then eventually you would reach this place where all of the material inside Jupiter had collected into the core. And thanks to Juno, they've been able to do a lot of observations of what the interior of Jupiter is probably more like. And it seems instead that it's more like the interior of Jupiter has this very hazy distinction between the bottom layers of the hydrogen and the helium and the actual core that is not this distinct boundary that is instead this sort of mushy boundary between the two. And the question was like, why is that? Why would that happen? You would expect the heaviest elements to fall down to the very middle and collect into this ball. And so people have done simulations and they've gone and said, well, maybe it's caused by something being smashed into Jupiter. And so they ran simulations and found like if you hit Jupiter with another really large object, like hit it with a Neptune, then you're going to get this this sort of mix up of the material at the center of Jupiter, but it's going to settle down very quickly, not take you know, billions and billions of years. So in fact, the that there is some kind of ongoing process with Jupiter that is keeping its internal state less uh, separated into specific layers and more into just this kind of general uh, hazy distinction and boundary. Now with Earth, if you just kept adding atmosphere to Earth, then you would still keep that distinct boundary between the center of the Earth and the outer atmosphere. But that sort of internal structure of Jupiter appears to be the case with all of the large planets that it's kind of similar to Saturn, it's kind of similar to Uranus, it's kind of similar to Neptune, for what we can tell, um, and is probably the case. And so who knows that if you add enough material, if you turn Earth into a Jupiter, that whatever is that process that is causing this, this sort of fuzzy boundary between the core and the the atmosphere, you would probably get that with Earth as well. But who knows if you turn a terrestrial planet into a gas giant, as opposed to just letting a gas giant form the way that it normally forms through the interactions with the early solar system. In excess, Fraser, do you think we should invest time in mastering interspecies communication here on Earth first before we try to contact other civilizations? I mean, we have no idea if any practice that we get communicating with other species here on Earth is going to give us any benefit in being able to communicate with another intelligent advanced civilization. But there are benefits to learning how to communicate with other species here on Earth, you know, like you can sense the intelligence 
of say if you've ever interacted with a parrot, you know, or a crow, or you've seen the way a monkey or an ape is interacting with its environment. Uh, you can even see it with like a pig. Uh, and of course, people who who work with dolphins and whales are finding that they're surprisingly intelligent. Uh, octopuses are very intelligent in a sort of weird alien way. And people are coming up with the different techniques to be able to test what they're, you know, do they pass the mirror test? Are they able to communicate? Are they able to learn sign language? There's a lot of things that people are trying to to do with, with other species. And I think that alone provides us with a tremendous amount of information. I think for, you know, for the longest time, humanity has assumed that you know, we are the dominant species on this planet and the animals exist for our service. Whether it's to eat them, whether it's to have them do labor for us, they are uh, meat robots that we use however we want. And that anyone would, you know, do animals experience pain? Of course they don't. Do insects experience pain? Of course they don't, right? Because realizing that the the meat slaves that we use for various things that we do uh, causes them distress. And we are starting to learn the true nature of the distress that we are putting these animals through both in captivity in you know, industrial slaughterhouses, things like that, and what we're doing to them in nature as we interact with them. You know, boats are going by causing constant noise. You know, there's a lot of really pissed off orcas in the Mediterranean, which are which are chomping on sailboats, or maybe they're having fun, who knows, we should learn to be able to talk with them. And there's some really interesting progress that is going on. I know the SETI Institute and, and various uh, marine biologists are starting to uh, try to communicate with with whales. And and that sounds like the like one of the most interesting options that we have. And we could get to this place where we could have a communication with them that would be mind blowing. Or maybe we won't. Maybe we'll try all these different ideas. And the SETI Institute describes this as practice, as a way for us to be able to uh, learn, you know, as, as we learn how to interact with a, you know, with another kind of intelligence here on our planet, this is going to give us some valuable lessons and tips to interacting with another advanced civilization. But sort of by definition, an alien civilization is one that is evolved in a completely different environment that they share you know, they share living in a universe with matter and energy. And that's about it. And clearly, they have some sort of technological advancement that's allowed us to communicate with us. But that's it. That's all we've got. And who knows? And so I like I really love that science fiction explores these ideas. You know, if you've watched the movie Arrival, uh, that was a great movie about how do we learn to interact with a with a civilization that has very little in common with us. And yet maybe we can figure out a way to do it. And it's been well explored in science fiction books, you know, some great authors who have plotted out alien civilizations that are utterly alien to us. Greg Bear is a great author for this kind of thing. Uh, where you just go like, I don't understand these aliens, but they are a problem. Uh, and so I think it's I think it's gonna be interesting. So just practicing our techniques, getting better at understanding the world around us is always a good thing and gaining more compassion and understanding of the plight of animals here on Earth is very useful to us for living here on Earth as well. So all this stuff is good for us to do research. It's time to shout out our new patrons of the $5 level and above Aurelis, Dan Kelsey, Richard Cornbluth, Peleg Dennis Wadsworth, Robin Murdoch, Ashley, Simon Cove, Louis Lamberty, Bill Hicks, and Martin Jimenez. Join our community at patreon.com slash universe today. Aaron T, how do you feel about the rising number of fake space videos made by AI? I am against it. <laughs> um, it's terrible. It's a plague. Uh, and, and the thing that I don't think you realize is how much YouTube is complicit in this. So any creator that does this, um, if I go to my YouTube channel dashboard and I go to content, the leftmost, like most important tab in the content tab in the YouTube studio is inspiration. 
and that is ideas that you should make and it's filled with AI. So they think that I should make a video about Mars life detection beyond methane, what's next, Mars sample return, SpaceX Starship alternatives, ancient impact theories debunking the misconceptions, space debris, a looming threat, fusion power, energy revolutionizing space travel. And then YouTube will give me a thumbnail that is AI generated. They will give me a script outline that is AI generated, and then they'll be willing to just write my entire script for me. And I say, no, thank you. That is gross. I don't want any part of that. Uh, that's the first part of this. The second part is if you go into the analytics tab of your YouTube, and then you click over on the trends, then you get a list of videos that are similar to what you're doing. Essentially, these are the videos that are trending in your field right now. And Again, I can't sort of show you the list, but every single one of them is AI slop. So new videos to inspire you. And that the first video says 3i Atlas is super intelligence from deep space. 3i Atlas is much bigger and stranger than we thought. Oh, that's angry astronaut. Okay. NASA's new report reveals that 3i Atlas's body is growing. Uh, James Webb telescope just warned the world. 3 Atlas, why is NASA hiding what they found? The US shut down James Webb Telescope after this was found. Like it's all spam. It's all AI slop. There's, there's, they're not just like being confused and showing me a couple of AI slop videos that are trending in, in the field right now. They are 100% slop. Right? Like, uh, except for Angry Astronaut, you know, who I just disagree with. <laughs> Right, but at least it's not slop. This is the state of of what YouTube is not only permitting on their platform, but is is finding exciting. It's titillating. Like like they're ooh, this is what we like. This is good stuff. Right, finally, finally. Instead of having encouraging people who are space journalists or scientists to communicate the, the actual work that's being done by scientists to the public, let's just double down on garbage that is being generated at uh, top speed with uh, AI on top of AI generating AI videos. Like you can use every part of the, of the, of the Google AI stack right? Like you can use Gemini to generate the outlines. You can use uh, Nano Banana to create the thumbnails. You can use VO3 to create the video. You can use Google LM to be able to do the research. You can put the whole thing together. And then you can just start to use Google Gemini to, to code up all the connections so the stuff all gets generated. Go into the API, press a button, out pops a video, uploads directly to YouTube. You can do this 10 an hour, 100 an hour, 1,000 an hour. Keep going, right? Like that's where we're going. And like how can they be okay with this? This is not good for the future of Google. This is not good for the future of YouTube. This is bad because it is – is going to drive the the value of information on the YouTube down to zero. That you're going to look at that a person's going to go like, I want to watch some YouTube today. Let me see what's going on on the YouTube. And it's just slop, 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 right? It's like, I'm going to eat some breakfast today. Let me see what's in my compost bucket. <laughs> you know, slop, slop, slop. That is going to be the future. And they will have destroyed all of the goodwill, all of the value of their platform, because they are trying to jump on the AI revolution. And then like the Hail Mary, maybe just maybe the AI is going to get so good so quickly that they will have dodged a bullet that YouTube will come out the other side of this, where the AIs are making videos that are genuinely good, well researched, high quality. I don't think that's going to happen at the rate at which they're destroying their brand. And so we will get to this place where one after another, we will abandon YouTube as a place where we go to be entertained and we will we will fragment off into people who just want to watch algorithmic slop because it's, you know, is titillating and they enjoy what's being served at them just despite its 
you know, how much it is uh, connected to reality and how much of it is going to um, be hived off into small communities. So like I am, you know, I've talked about this quite a bit that I am doubling down, tripling down on Patreon over there, right? Don't let the algorithm tell you what to watch. Come join me and this amazing community over on Patreon where I give you additional content, longer videos, uh, I answer your questions. I interact with with the audience. That I'm going to create this haven, this this place where you guaranteed that you're going to get good human based space reporting on a regular basis that meets all of your needs, and you don't have to dip your toes into the algorithmic slop pile. You don't have to search for your breakfast in the compost bin. Uh, you can get nothing but uh, high quality, top grade, human created content for you. So uh, well, how do I feel about it? I am against it is how I feel about it. Did you know that you can watch the same video with no ads and get a bonus question over on Patreon completely for free? And we call it Q&A Plus. And this week's bonus question, will Vera Rubin find an asteroid on collision course with Earth? And I'll put a link in the show notes. All right, those are all the questions that we had this episode. Thank you, everyone, who asked your questions in the YouTube comments, everybody who joined me for the live show, which we record every Monday uh, at 5 p.m. somewhere in the world. Uh, I'll put a link to the next event here on the channel. So just go and click the notification bell so that you'll get a reminder of when we do that next live stream. Now, I'm going to chat about how you can get your questions answered guaranteed. But first, I'd like to thank our patrons. Thanks to Abe Kingston, Andrew Gross, Bradley Griffin, Brian Bode, Caridwin, Chuck Hawkins, Commander Bailock, Cy Nelson, David Varyoff, David Giltonet, David Matz, Evan Pro, Greg Feely, Hudson Ward, James Clark, Jeremy Madden, Jim Burke, Jordan Young, Josh Schultz, Marcel Smith, Michael Purcell, Monzo, Paul Robach, Ren Kaidu, Richard Williams, Sean Sargent, Stephen Fallon Munley, Team 49, Vlad Shiplin, and Wolfgang Klotz, who support us at the Master of the Universe level and all our patrons. All your support means the universe to us. So you are watching The Question Show, and this is The Question Show that we record every Monday during the live stream, which is two hours long. It's a lot of fun, back and forth. And I try to answer as many questions as I can. I usually get through about 40 to 60 questions during the two hour live stream. And as I always say, there's an event here on the channel that you can check that out. But if you want to be part of that elite team of people who get your questions answered by me, uh, we also do a patrons question show once a month on Patreon. And so right now, actually, I've put out the call to the patrons to give me their questions. And we're collecting all the questions and we're in the process of recording them. We will probably start to begin recording the episode typically lasts about four to five hours long the full episode because we just we answer every single question that we get, no matter what it is. And some of them require research and me and my producer, Anton, we just get through all of them. So uh, if you want to kind of take your question answering to the next level, and I promise you they're really cool questions, uh, come to patreon.com slash universe today, sign up as a patron at any level, that'll give you access to the entire back catalog of all of the patrons question shows. And you can then ask your question and it is guaranteed you can also do the meeting with me. There's a lot of other cool benefits that you get by joining our Patreon. So patreon.com slash universe today. And of course, you're supporting an independent space journalism agency. And, uh, you know, it's great. We have no ads on the website, no ads in the newsletter, no ads in the podcast, just funded by the patrons, and I'm able to pay the salaries of everybody who works on our team. So uh, this is how we do it. And we try to give you as many benefits as we can. But really, you're supporting journalism. All right, we'll see you next time.